I think everyone in the VA can hear me when I talk to them. So, well, thank you very much. Um, the title of my talk is Future Advances <coughs> in Refractive Surgery. The future is in sort of semi quotes because the two things that I will possibly talk about, but certainly the one, depending on how much time we have, uh, people are already doing both of these things, we're just not seeing them in the US. This is a picture from Nepal as a fourth year med student. I spent a month out at the Tolkanga Eye Institute. And that's actually where I first kind of learned about the first um, refractive procedure that I'll be talking about. So that I don't forget, um, acknowledgements are very important to this talk because a lot of the information data and a lot of the images um, are courtesy of Dr. Reinstein as well as Dr. Kishore, um, who are both kind of worked in conjunction to set up the eye center and the refractive center in Telganga, and then Dr. Mehta in Singapore and Dr. Moshevar here, who I spoke to a little bit. So the outline of my presentation, um, we'll see if we get to the bottom half with time. We may just do the top half. But what I'd like to talk about is small incision lenticular extraction. It's named SMILE. It's a procedure that's been around and in, in the literature for about the last three to four years and presents some of the initial data as well as some of uh, data that's not published yet but is out of Nepal and has a little um, more power to it in terms of the numbers of patients. So what is SMILE? I figured before we start talking about it, it would make the most sense to try to figure out exactly what it is. So first I'll show you a little animation and then we'll show you kind of a surgical video. In essence, what you do with the procedure, it's an all femto refractive surgery. And so you cut, you're cutting a lenticular lens. So you cut the posterior surface first and then cut an anterior surface with the femtosecond laser. And it pr produces a lens shaped or lenticule. Then you make a, about a four millimeter side cut incision with the femtosecond laser as well. This animation doesn't show. It will just pull that out. <laughs> that lenticule does not just pull out. You have to do some dissecting, which you'll see on the surgery. Um, but you dissect anteriorly above the lenticule and then posteriorly above the lenticule. Thank you, Zeiss, for that wonderful um, and, and then you're able to pull that out. So this is just a quick video. I, I won't show all of it, but part of it from Dr. Kishore, and there'll be a little freeze in this video. It doesn't actually take as long, but this is again, you cut the posterior aspect of the lenticule, which is slightly deeper, deeper in the corneal stroma than typical LASIK or PRK. Then you'll cut the anterior. There's not actually a pause like this. I think this is just the video it gets caught up on YouTube, um, but then it'll continue to ablate the anterior surface. And you'll see that the anterior surface, it will go to the edge of the posterior and then extend farther so that when they make the side cuts, um, you'll be able to get access, gain access to the lenticule. And you'll see there's actually two cuts that are made. So there's one four millimeter about side cut that's made here. There's also a about two, I think it's two or two and a half millimeter depending on the ablation profile that's cut here. Most times that is not opened up, um, but it can be if you're having difficulty dissecting the um, lenticule out. And then the actual dissection, so then you, obviously, m this is actually usually done with the, at the slit lamp that the patient's sitting at with the microscope. So you'll see, you'll come in, and you first dissect where that side cut is at. He'll dissect over the anterior portion first, right at the lip of the lenticule, and then he'll dissect posteriorly underneath the lip of the lenticule. And you'll see, because it's uh, sort of a photodisruptive mechanism, there is still some adhesion but he'll get that cleared. And then once that, he has the initial lip cleared, then he'll proceed to kind of dissect over the entire anterior surface and then the entire posterior <coughs> surface. And the whole process takes probably uh, for each eye, generally about, I would say like two to three minutes. And most of the procedures that I saw him watch and most of the YouTube videos that you'll see, you'll see that he'll ex make sure that he extends <coughs> all the way out. Um, the one thing that, he's very careful about, um, and that seems to be very important, is to make sure that you're not leaving any, in essence, tags of the lenticule that could cause a like post-operative um, astigmatism because you would have some retained lenticule in there. But so you'll see he'll dissect anteriorly. And then I'll jump ahead just a little bit. I think actually he might have dissected posteriorly when I was talking. Okay. And then you'll just see he'll go in, he will grab the lenticule, and then remove it out. 
And you won't see it here on this video because this one ends before. But typically then what, we'll, what he'll do is he'll put some BSS on top um, and then in essence lay that lenticule back out over the surface to ensure that there's no tags um, or any retained parts of the lenticule. If there is, then you would kind of coordinate that based on where it is and try to go back in and find that. The times I saw him, there was never a case where that happened. Though, so. Does anyone have any questions about the procedure itself? So I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about a quick review of the literature in terms of the data just that's... Uh, just one thing, is yeah. that, that, that due to the fact that uh, uh, the thing, sensor seconds are totally acclimated to cornea, to usually hold, I think there's a lot of feeling that the first acclimating surface is a good advantage to getting into that cornea on the field. Okay. Good to know. Um, the initial data, there's been kind of a bunch of different people that have published data. Secundo, I think, was the first one that I set found that was out of Germany. He was actually, this was prior to the, when they were doing the small incision, they were actually still creating an entire flap, but they were still cutting the lenticule. So they were cutting the lenticule and then a flap, flipping it over and removing the lenticule and then putting the flap back down. Um, and his initial data that was back in 2008 uh, showed some relative success, although, and you'll notice, A, there's very small numbers in most of the studies that are in the literature right now, and a lot of times, the sort of reliability in terms of how close they are to their predicted target outcome isn't what we see necessarily in LASIK in this country, which is why there's been some concern about it. Dr. Shaw published kind of the first, to my knowledge, the first data that was on the actual small incision portion of it. She had 51 eyes. Her results were kind of concerning to a lot of the refractive surgeons here, which um, is why I think it'll be a while till it catches on. But her Uncorrected distance visual acuity was only at 80% at 2025, which is you know, relatively poor compared to the LASIK outcomes that people are getting here. And so there was a lot of pushback. Um, there was also two eyes that lost one line of corrected distance visual acuity. Um, certainly you don't want people losing two lines, but even one line is, and most of the refractive patients would not be appreciated here. Secundo did a follow-up study in 2011 where he was actually using the small incision technique. And you'll see that he actually published a lot better results than what Dr. Shaw did <coughs> in terms of outcomes and in terms of, you'll also see by doing the small incision versus the entire flap that the percentage of patients that are within kind of the target range of one diopter and or half a diopter are a lot closer than they were previously. There's some thought that that also is due to sort of the ablation pattern and some advances in the technology as they've learned about and studied different the best technique for the ablation pattern. So the thought right now is that you do always do the posterior surface first, but you go from peripherally to centrally, and then on the anterior part, you go from central to peripheral. And that's been sh shown in a couple studies to have the best outcomes. Uh, one other one that was recently in the JCRS from Kazutaka in Japan, uh, who actually showed very good results um, in terms of uncorrected distance visual acuity. And I didn't really see in looking over that paper a great explanation for why they felt like they were getting so much better results than what's been previously published by Dr. Shaw as well as um, the group in Germany. But they had uncorrected distance visual acuity of 20-20 in all of their patients, which was 38 eyes. So there's some evidence that maybe, um, you know, the, with the new so improvements in the ablation pattern that there might be some improvements in the outcomes. Also, interestingly, I thought they did two other things that they wanted to check on. First was the stability of the manifest refraction. And so they only have six months follow-up. But you'll see that the, you know, at the, like, about one week to one month um, time period compared to the six-month time period, you have pretty good stability in terms of the uh, spherical equivalence of their eye. And they also looked at the endothelial cell count because there's some thought that this is a deeper ablation than you have with either LASIK or PRK so that you're more at risk for having damage to the endothelial cells. And there had not been any evidence prior to this about the sort of documentation of that. And they found that while there's a slight decrease, it's not statistically significant and there doesn't seem to be significant damage. The next thing I wanted to do was just present some results from Nepal because one of the things that um, a lot of that data had was very small power in terms of their numbers. This is uh, Nepal one day results. You'll notice that the N on some of these results is different, and that's mostly because 
uh, some of their data they haven't kind of gotten through. So I <coughs> talked to Dr. Kishore and got some of it, but not all of it. And it's not published, so it's also, there's some, you know, it obviously hasn't peer reviewed yet and been completely looked at. How this many eyes are you talking about? Oh, so this is just 75. The 75 next. 75 for the entire course? This is. This is for the smile part. And actually, you'll see, I don't know why they don't have more one-day data, because the next one, which is one month, they have 320 eyes <coughs> in the smile, um, which we'll go over. But as a demonstration, the, the point being that their results in terms of a one-day prognosis are similar to LASIK, and, and the thought process is similar to PRK, or unlike PRK, you're not disrupting the epithelium, and so that the, these patients typically do have relatively decent vision at day one already, which is... Um, something that's appreciated. Their one month data, again, I don't have a good explanation for why the ends are so different, but this is looking at, I think he's done close to 800 now in the entire year. So this is kind of the first three quarters of the year, the data that they've processed and looked through, but 320 eyes and smile and 118 at LASIK. This is all at their refractive center there. And of note, what you'll see is there, if you're looking at post-op uncorrected distance visual acuity compared to pre-op corrected distance visual acuity, the results that they're getting in terms of LASIK and SMILE are relatively similar. Um, he doesn't have the six-month data or year data available yet, and obviously that will be important to look for. Um, but it seems that the data is definitely better than what Dr. Shah was initially reporting and that there may be some future for this. Predictability is also an important thing. This just shows some regression models and just demonstrates that both with the LASIK and the SMILE, you're getting kind of similar predictability in terms of your outcomes. Most importantly, you'll notice one of the things that's been mentioned with SMILE previously, and I'll go over why they think this is, is that you can target higher refractive error, or higher myopia, and, f um, and still feel that you have some safety without risk of ectasia, and I'll go over why that is. But they have ablation patterns up between eight and minus, minus eight and minus 12. Um, Obviously, there's importance of sort of safety. Safety, as they consider it, is sort of not losing uncorrected distance or corrected distance visual acuity. What you will see is then smile. They did. They have had at least one patient that's lost two lines, and they've had some that have lost one, which is greater than what you see in LASIK. So there's still some concern for why that's occurring, and they don't necessarily. In, in talking to Dr. Kishore, he doesn't have a great explanation necessarily at this point for why that is whether that's something to do with the interface of the two femtosecond <coughs> surfaces coming together or what that might be. I wanted to spend just a little bit of time going over some of the potential advantages of SMILE and why I think we'll probably see it here in the U.S. and that it may, I don't know if it'll take over sort of what LASIK and PRK is, but I do think we'll see it becoming more evident. First thing is you have a decreased incidence of post-op dry eye or kind of post-op neuropathy of the cornea, and I'll explain why that is. There's some biomechanical advantages. There's decreased risk of flap complications. Now, you still have a stromal bed that's in there, and so you could still have epithelial ingrowth, but you don't have the risk of the flap dehiscence. And then it only requires one laser as well, which maybe from a business perspective, um, as more you know, practices are using femtosecond laser for cataract-assisted, procedures, you may see more interest in this as well, because you just need the femto for it. So a little bit kind of about the reasoning why there's thought to be less um, post-op dry eyes or post-op corneal neuropathy. Um, in essence, what you're doing in SMILE, like I said, the stromal lenticule is a little bit deeper in the cornea. So you can see here, you know, your posterior surface, generally they try to set the stromal cap to be about 130 to 150 microns. Can go a little bit deeper depending on the patient's cornea depth. But you have a, by doing that and by not cutting an entire LASIK flap, the theory is that you preserve some of the corneal, like subepithelial nerve plexus and that the patients then will have greater residual sort of corneal sensation. As opposed to LASIK, which is more a cutting through and transecting when you make the flap that entire corneal nerve plexus. And Dr. Reinstein has just done sort of a, a s relatively small look at this that's not been published, so again, it's not completely peer-reviewed, but of 39 eyes that he had after smile procedure and using this kind of cochette bonnet, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, isciometer to look at, it's in essence a monofilament for the cornea, 
and looking at the results and kind of comparing it to a bunch of LASIK studies that he's, that kind of have measured that. And what he found was in comparison to sort of the average of all the LASIK studies that he looked at was that especially at day one or day zero kind of, you have a significant um, improvement in terms of the corneal sensation. There's still a reduction, whether that's because you're still transecting some of the nerves or it's just from the manipulation of the dissection. Um, it, as you can see in the long run, at six months out, there's probably not a whole lot of difference. But for a short period of time anyway, you have a decrease, it appears in terms of, or an improvement in the corneal sensation. The other thing that I wanted to mention, which is why I think we'll see it in the United States, is that there's a theoretical sort of biomechanical advantage to the procedure and why we can do it in higher myopes. There's been a f one of the studies that Dr. Reinstein quotes a lot and I think is an interesting study. It was looking at sort of the tensile strength of different stromal fibers from the anterior cornea to the posterior cornea and what they found was that there was a sort of negative relationship in terms of the tensile strength of the corneal stroma. So the anterior corneal stroma has greater tensile strength than the posterior cornea. And if you kind of look at it, you know, if you estimate kind of going from about an 80 to maybe about a 40, about a 50 percent, I guess that you could view it as a 50 percent decrease or 100 percent increase in terms of the corneal strength. And so the idea is then with LASIK, when we do LASIK and cut a flap as well as ablate the anterior surface, we're in essence kind of taking out any strength that we might get from that anterior stroma um, <coughs> in terms of preventing risk of ectasia and we have preservation of sort of this posterior stroma that's back and behind. Whereas with the smile procedure, the, in theory, the thought is that by cutting the lenticule and just making a small incision, you still have some preservation of some of these anterior stromal fibers, um, which have a little bit more tensile strength. You still are ablating the central part and leaving yourself with some posterior, but that there might be decreased risk of ectasia after procedure. This is sort of, I like to call it maybe some funny math, but <laughs> uh, I, the, I, this, this kind of illustrates maybe the concept or idea. So the thought process is if, if you have a, if you take an example of a 500 micron cornea and you ablate 150 microns of it, with a 100 micron LASIK flap, you in essence have a residual stroma of 250 because with the flap you're not really retaining very much strength from that anterior stroma. Whereas the thought is with SMILE, again, about 130 micron cap would leave you with about 80 microns of stroma anteriorly. That still has some stromal integrity and tensile strength to it. You have the residual stroma bed that's slightly less than in the LASIK. But if you do combine these, because you're saying that the stroma does have some tensile strength remaining, you have an equivalent total of about 300. And then if you also factor in the fact that that anterior stroma theoretically has more tensile strength, you could possibly postulate that you may actually have an even larger effective total. And that's the thought process for why you could treat higher myopes without, with a decreased risk of ectasia. So here's just a quick summary of those advantages. I think it'll be interesting. I think there's, my understanding is there is some FDA trials that are starting here in the States, but that there's no real published data about them. Certainly there's risks and considerations that need to be made. Obviously there's really no significant long-term data. So LASIK we have a lot of NPRK, significant data in terms of 10, 20 years out. Um, and this we don't really have that. You also have a, a limit of about a one diopter correction. Because you're making a lens or a lenticule, you have to have at least some depth to that lenticule to be able to dissect an anterior and posterior surface. Um, and then from a, I'm if you are a refractive surgeon and concerned, <laughs> one of your pa oftentimes patients want touch-ups and there's no real way to touch up a smile procedure by doing another smile procedure because again, you would in theory need something less than a diopter. So another problem that I definitely see with this is that if you do need a touch-up, then you end up needing to do PRK or needing to do LASIK. And that takes away your advantage of only needing one laser as well. There's a concern about, in my mind anyway, that there's some documentation of some loss of vision. <laughs> And then there's a question, you know, if you have the two photo disrupted surfaces of, uh, from the femtosecond laser, there's some people that think that that interface could cause people to have more problems with sort of rainbows type scotomas and sort of diffraction of light as it goes through. Um, Dr. Kishore hasn't had that reported by any of his patients yet, but 
it very well could be something to be considered. Um, future directions of this procedure that I think are worth noting. So the group out of Singapore is actually currently doing a randomized non-inferiority trial between SMILE and LASIK that hopefully will be published here in the next year or two. I think it'll be interesting to see the results of that and try to establish whether <coughs> there is a difference between the two. Um, currently, like I said, there's no real published large data sets. I know that Dr. Kishore is planning on publishing his results, I think once he gets it was about 800 patients kind of total to compare. Um, and just because I thought it was really intriguing and totally off the wall, there was also a, a group that studied the feasibility of actually re-implanting the lenticule. They did it in rabbits, but they actually took out the lenticule, uh, stored it for like 28 days, and then re-implanted it and looked for any sort of interface issues or inflammatory reactions. And then after they had re-implanted it for 28 days, they uh, killed other rabbits and investigated them and kind of took a look. And they didn't see any sort of interface or inflammatory reactions. The thought process is that maybe you could preserve those and save those if the patient did develop ectasia, that there might be some. I don't really think that it would be of benefit, but who knows, maybe in the future sometime there'll be something. Um, with that, I will not go. I was going to talk about laser blended surgery for presbyopia, but we don't have time for that. So I'll just end on my public service announcement from Nepal, and this is to make sure that my talk is relevant to everyone. So you need to make sure that you're eating your fruits and vegetables because if you're an anterior segment surgeon, if you don't, you're going to get cataracts, and you'll also probably get macular degeneration because you're not having your vitamins. And Dr. Crum will be very interested to know that your skin gets horribly worse and that you probably are gonna need eyelid surgery. And from a neuro-ophthalmologic standpoint, they definitely have vitamin deficiencies that could cause neurologic findings as well. So I will end there so that we end on time and just ask if anyone has any questions at this point. Yes. So, so obviously the theoretical problem is is that uh, uh, however you treat this, if you're going to also create a refractive error, you're going to have one length of your posterior curve that is a different distance than your anterior curve. But I'm sure those who are losing vision that the settling of that is causing some type of irregularity. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be some way that we can look at that with the baseline of L-score because you, you, you know, you've got that theoretical problem. And, and it's not like when you're doing a, a laser splat where you've got room for a little movement on the periphery. You don't fix it on the outside. Yep. So I, <coughs> I think that uh, I'm impressed with the results I've seen. And I, I thought it would be a much bigger problem than it proved to be. Yeah. And then you also don't know what's going to settle. You've got your posterior cornea <coughs> that can certainly, if it's weak enough, is going to move up. And you've got your <coughs> collapse of your anterior cornea. And, and those two effects, depending on how they go, I'm sure are great. I think that's fair. And I, they, didn't, they don't really have any great data in terms of published, or that Dr. Kishore provided in terms of the as <coughs> residual astigmatism in their patients. Mostly it was just spherical equivalent. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, when I was looking through like all those previous data, all the previous kind of published data, there hasn't really been anyone that, that I saw that looked at sort of higher order aberrations afterwards. Mostly they were looking at corrected. There's a few people then that then started to do the endothelial count and looking at OCTs of the interface, but I haven't seen any published data. There have been some reports and sessions in the rest, and there's definitely an increase in higher order aberrations. And that would make sense. How important those are, but, but I, I'm, I'm sure of that there's going to be some qualitative difference. Uh, and remember, if you're looking at qualitative difference in regards to vision, uh, often snubbing visual acuity in the Sharp minor is not the perfect way to look at that. And so I think subtle ways of looking at contrast sensitivity are, are certainly going to be a more powerful way to take a look at this. Uh, but, but yeah, there's, I mean, you can't, you can't have one curve or the other and not have some impact in regards to higher order aberrations. Yeah. Whether that's important or not, Yeah, yeah, I mean, so when I was out there, I, I think I watched about 20 of them, and yeah, I mean, most of the patients, you can see kind of from the post-op data, but most of them day one were like very happy, 
and they sort of have an interesting setup in Nepal where they're trying to do a lot of them. And so they have pain patients, but they were also doing free refractive surgery on patients as well. Also, it'll be interesting to see if you start to see sort of medical tourism related to that. It's sort of an aside, but you can go and have smile done for I think about like 400 or 500 US dollars in Nepal. So you could have a pay for your flight and have it cost about the same and get to go to Nepal. So I do know that the, uh, the victims that BNL has <coughs> as well as the lens us uh, are all set up in basic media to see people. They have the curved interface, they have the ability in a slight downside to the water interface issue that may be advantageous so much that cataract patients they could not do this in right. any way. And in Europe, I know the victims is already doing that. Doing it. Thank you very much.